In the summer of 2003, the body of 36-year-old Sabrina Payne was found in a field near Tremont, Illinois. Sabrina was a black female who was known to support a drug habit with prostitution. Sabrina had last been seen at her home two days before her body was found. The original autopsy failed to determine a cause of death, leading some of the detectives to believe she had overdosed. One detective, however, felt uneasy about that assumption. His suspicions were confirmed as more bodies were found in Peoria and Tazewell counties over the next year. On February 5, 2004, the body of 36-year-old Barbara Williams was found in a ditch near Edwards, Illinois. She was found partially clothed and lying face down in the snow. She had been seen alive between 9 and 10 p.m. the night before. An autopsy showed that she had multiple contusions and abrasions on her body. Toxicology showed that she had fatal levels of cocaine in her blood. At this point, police were not ready to call this a murder or entertain the idea of a serial killer preying on black drug-addicted prostitutes. In October of 2004, 32-year-old Shakanda Thomas was reported missing. She had last been seen by her family in August. Shakanda was known to disappear at times, but when she didn't come back after several weeks, her family reported her missing. Shirley and Trapp was also reported missing in the late summer of 2004. She was seen three days before she was reported missing. Tamara Walls was reported missing in September of 2004, after not being seen for three weeks. All three missing women were also black females known to support a crack cocaine habit with prostitution. 36-year-old mother of eight, Laura Lawler, disappeared from her home after leaving with a man and woman. Her longtime partner searched for her but only was able to determine she had been with a man named Larry. Her boyfriend, and father to her seven daughters and one son, describes Laura as the love of his life and a beautiful soul. The two had experimented with crack cocaine, and Laura seemed to struggle with addiction before her disappearance. On September 25, 2004, Linda Neal was found on King Road in Taswell County. She was found nude along the side of the road. Linda, like the other women, was known to be part of the drug scene in Peoria. At this point, police had determined there was likely a serial killer stalking black females in the Peoria area. A task force was formed, which one detective states would have occurred much quicker if the victims had been white females. While police desperately searched for the killer, they kept a close eye on women in the community at risk. Despite their efforts, on October 15, 2004, Brenda Irving's body was found in a ditch near Farmington. Brenda was found nude, and an autopsy determined that she had been strangled and suffered blunt force trauma to her head. She also had fatal levels of cocaine in her system at the time of her death. Her children had feared for their mother's safety, as she had known many of the women who had been killed or disappeared from central Illinois. Brenda struggled with drug addiction. Despite detectives' best efforts, the case proved difficult to solve. They followed thousands of leads, but finally got the lead they were waiting for in December of 2004. 35-year-old Vicki Bomer was arrested for theft. From jail, she told authorities that she thought she could help them find the serial killer preying on her fellow sex workers. She believed that a man who had picked her up in July 2004 was responsible. Bomer explained that in July, a man named Larry Bright lured her to his mother's home where they shared alcohol and drugs. Once she was intoxicated, she said Bright attacked her, attempted to rape her, and pulled a knife on her. Somehow, Bomer was able to escape. Police were at first skeptical, as Bomer asked for a plea deal in exchange for her testimony. Why hadn't she reported this back in July? Why wait until she was under arrest? Vicky Bomer claimed she was scared of being arrested for outstanding warrants, which is why she did not come forward in July 2004. A search of her criminal history confirmed the warrants, so detectives decided to take a look at the man named Larry Bright. Larry Dean Bright was born in Peoria, Illinois, on July 8, 1966. He served a two-year stint in prison at age 19 for burglary and carjacking. According to Larry's family, the time Larry spent in prison changed him for the worse. Larry became more angry and violent and began using drugs. Larry had an injury, which started an addiction to prescription opioids and later crack cocaine. He also developed an addiction to pornography, preferring videos with black women. Larry lived with his mother in a tiny guest house behind her home. Larry enjoyed gardening, creating a beautiful garden bed of flowers for his mother. 
When the police arrived at Larry's home following the tip, they noticed the beautiful flowers in the garden. Larry was placed under arrest for the unlawful restraint of Vicky. They questioned Larry about the murders, but he denied having any information about the murdered and missing women. Throughout the interview, Larry smoked several cigarettes. Detectives planned to take one of the cigarette butts and test it for DNA, but Larry ate them before leaving the interrogation room. Larry declined to give DNA voluntarily. Police searched Larry Bright's home on January 20, 2005. The investigators dug up the garden, finding several small bone fragments and ashes that were later determined to be human. When the police questioned Larry again, they told him they were digging up his mother's flowers. At this point, Larry broke down and confessed to multiple murders. He even led investigators to the remains of some of his victims. Larry explained that around July 27, 2003, he picked up Sabrina Payne on the south side of Peoria. He drove her to his home, which he shared with his mother. He claimed the two drank and used cocaine before having consensual sex. Larry said he did not intend to kill Sabrina, but he became enraged, thinking Sabrina was trying to rip him off. He strangled her to death and dumped her body near the cornfield where she was found. Larry confessed to picking up Barbara Williams in February 2004. Again, he used drugs and alcohol with his victim. He stated that he once again lost control of his anger and killed Barbara. He claimed he caught Barbara stealing from him. He dumped her body along the road, where she was found the next day. The prosecution believed that after the first two murders, Larry developed a bloodlust. At the time of his arrest, he said, I knew then I would kill the others I would pick up. I went out hunting. Larry also confessed to killing Laura Lawler. He burned her body in his backyard burn pit, burying the remains in his mother's yard. He said he wanted to destroy the bodies to avoid getting caught. He confessed to killing Tamara Walls and burning her remains. Her jawbone was found in the backyard. He admitted to strangling, beating, and burning Shirley in trap. Shakonda Thomas had the same fate after being picked up by Larry Bright. He burned the woman and buried the ashes in the yard. Because of his attempts to cremate his victims, he was nicknamed the Bone Crusher. Larry said that he attempted to burn Linda Neal and Brenna Irving as well, but the attempts were unsuccessful due to the weather. He dumped both women along the side of the road. Larry was facing the death penalty following his January 2005 arrest. In an attempt to spare his mother the embarrassment of a trial and avoid the death penalty, Larry Bright pleaded guilty to seven counts of first-degree murder and one count of drug-induced homicide on May 30, 2006. Bright's murders were not considered racially motivated, but detectives believe he was just attracted to black women. He is one of the very few serial killers who chooses victims outside of his race. Larry was sentenced to seven life sentences without the possibility of parole, to be served concurrently. He was also given an additional 30 years for the drug-induced homicide. As part of the plea deal, Larry will be required to serve 100% of his sentence with no parole consideration. Larry is currently housed at the Shawnee Correctional Center in Vienna, Illinois. He will spend the rest of his life behind bars, but that brings little peace to the families of his victims. The loved ones of Larry's victims want people to know that the women he killed were more than just drug addicts or prostitutes, they were people. They were mothers, daughters, sisters, and friends. The serial killer dentist of St. Louis, Glennon Engelman. Dr. Glennon Engelman was born on February 6, 1927, in St. Louis, Missouri. Dr. Engelman grew up on the south side of the city and felt a deep connection to his neighborhood. After serving in the military, Dr. Engelman used his GI Bill to go to Washington University and become a dentist. He opened his dental office on the south side of St. Louis, serving the community he had always loved. Dr. Engelman, who went by Glenn, was married to a woman named Edna Ruth, but they divorced in 1956. By 1958, both Glenn and Ruth had remarried. Glenn was operating his dental office and appeared to be successfully serving the St. Louis community. On December 17, 1958, citizens in Forest Park noticed a bloody man stumbling. The man, James Stanley Bullock, soon passed from his injuries. These injuries were caused by a gunshot. No one could figure out why someone would shoot 28-year-old James Bullock. James Bullock was born on April 17, 1931, in DeSoto. 
He was raised in Shiloh, Illinois, by his grandparents and later his aunt after his parents passed away. According to an article from 1938, the then seven-year-old was living with his grandparents in 1938 and enjoyed attending school and fishing. James later served in the military before returning to St. Louis to work and go to college. Back in St. Louis, James met Edna Ruth, the ex-wife of Dr. Glenn Engelman. The two married, and six short months later, James was dead. An employee at a local sanitarium initially claimed James was there four days before his murder asking to be admitted because he feared for his life. His wife and aunt said this was not true, as the three had dinner together on that night. According to his widow and aunt, James was not afraid for his life, and they knew no one who would want him dead. However, Edna Ruth benefited greatly from her husband's death. Ruth had life insurance policies totaling $64,088. While under questioning, Edna Ruth made several weird statements including telling the police she was married before, but her husband did not know. Who was she married to? Her husband's dentist, Dr. Glenn Engelman. Edna Ruth had lied to James and his family and lied on the marriage application about being married before. Police questioned a local career criminal, who was out on parole for an assault at the time of the shooting. They weren't able to tie him to the murder of James, but they did note he lived near Dr. Engelman's office. Dr. Engelman and Edna Ruth both refused to take a polygraph test and denied any involvement in the murder of James Bullock. Dr. Engelman's new wife, Ida, refused to be questioned by the police. A patient provided an alibi for Dr. Engelman. However, another witness said that they tried to find someone at the office around that time and the office was empty. Edna Ruth invested part of the funds she received after becoming a widow into doctor. Been bored being a dentist, so he often ventured into other areas of business. This included Buying a drag strip along with a partner, Eric Fry. Dr. Engelman had grown to be close friends. With Eric and his wife Sandy. On September 26, 1963, Eric and Dr. Engelman were at the drag strip using dynamite to explode and then fill abandoned cisterns on the property. Eric was lying on his stomach near one of the cisterns when the dynamite exploded quicker than anticipated. Eric was killed instantly and found lying in the bottom of the cistern. Coroner H.D. Steinbeck ruled the death accidental. Mr. Frey's wife had an insurance policy on her husband, which she invested part of into Dr. Engelman's practice. Dr. Engelman divorced Ida and married his third wife, Ruth, in 1967. The couple shared a son, but Ruth hated the close relationship her husband had with a young woman who worked in his office named Carmen Miranda. Dr. Engelman offered to train Carmen to be a dental assistant in his office. Edna felt uncomfortable with the flirting between the doctor and his young assistant. Dr. Engelman, however, claimed he was trying to help people in his community. He hired Carmen's brother. Nick, as well at one point. Ruth was relieved when Carmen met a married man named Peter Holm. Just a few months later, however, Carmen and Eric were walking in a rural area in Pacific, Missouri. The couple were exploring an area known to have caves and scenic paths. A shot suddenly fired, hitting Peter in the head. Peter died instantly, and a hysterically Carmen flagged down help. Nearby, police found an X on a tree made with tape. The area was familiar to locals as a hunting area and police believed that the shot was accidental. Police believed someone was target shooting at the X and accidentally struck Mr. Holm. Carmen had a significant amount of life insurance on her husband, totaling $60,000. This is equivalent to around $300,000 in 2024. Dr. Engelman and Ruth divorced soon after, at which time Dr. Engelman married young Carmen, whom he had known since she was a small child. His son lived with Edna, his ex-wife. Despite being married to Carmen, Dr. Engelman and Ruth still met regularly for sex. Dr. Engelman constantly had extramarital affairs, which included previous affairs with Carmen, Ruth, and even Sandy Fry, the wife of his business associate Eric Fry who was killed by dynamite. Another of Dr. Engelman's affairs was with a patient named Barbara Boyle. On November 3, 1977, someone pretending to be from the Farm Bureau walked up to the farmhouse owned by Arthur and Vernita Goosewell in Edwardsville, Illinois. Soon after entering the home, the elderly couple were attacked, and both were shot in the head. The wealthy couple left $340,000 to their son, Ronald Goosewell. Guess who Ronald Goosewell was married to? Barbara Boyle. 
On April 4, 1979, less than two years after the murder of his parents, Ronald Guswell was found dead inside his car outside a hotel in East St. Louis, Illinois. The man had been beaten and shot to death. He had been missing for four days when his body was found. Following her husband's murder, Barbara collected his inheritance in addition to several life insurance policies. The equivalent sum of money today would be nearly $1.7 million. Guess who she caught to? Dr. Glennon Engelman. Following the murder of Ronald Guswell, authorities were starting to notice the trend of connected deaths to Dr. Engelman. His patients and community, however, only saw a generous man committed to helping his community and its citizens. Dr. Engelman was not the greatest dentist, however. He often did a sloppy job of making casts for dentures and dental appliances, requiring the work to have to be redone by the dental lab several times. His business was struggling, however, and he soon found himself in debt with the dental lab owned by Sophie Barrera. Sophie Barrera owned the South St. Louis Dental Laboratory and had grown tired of waiting for Dr. Engelman to pay up by 1980. She filed a lawsuit against the doctor that was set to go to court just a few days after Sophie was murdered. On January 14, 1980, Sophie entered her vehicle in South St. Louis. Shortly after, the vehicle exploded. Police found remnants of a bomb under her charred vehicle. Sophie had told her son before she was in fear of being killed. She believed Dr. Glenn Engelman was dangerous. Dr. Engelman was questioned for three hours and then released. Police were certain he was responsible for Sophie's death, but they had to prove it. The public also wondered if the bombing was related to another bombing in the area that was carried out between two mob families fighting for control over St. Louis's labor unions. The evidence indicated, however, that this was not a mob hit. The number one suspect was the man who owed Sophie $15,000. Dr. Engelman had to be stopped, but the police weren't sure how to do it. Detectives soon began having conversations with Dr. Engelman's ex-wife and mother of his son, Ruth. Ruth told police nothing at first, but eventually started to talk. She explained that Dr. Engelman often bragged about killing people. He told her that he had a superpower, he was able to kill without remorse. He had admitted to killing Eric Fry, Peter Holm, and the Guswell family. It was his side hustle, killing for profit. Ruth agreed to help the police, but none of her testimony could be used in court because Dr. Engelman confessed to her while the two were still married. He was protected by spousal privilege. Ruth decided to wear a wire, however, and met up with Dr. Engelman to exchange their son and sometimes just to socialize. They were still having a sexual relationship despite Dr. Engelman's marriage to Carmen. She tried to get Dr. Engelman to confess to her again by asking direct questions. He didn't seem to take the bait at first, and Ruth feared he would kill her next. Ruth suggested police plant a bug in her bedroom and she would invite the dentist over for sex. Dr. Engelman was suspicious, however, and did not say anything that could lead to his arrest. Ruth then met him at a diner wearing a wire, and this time he commented on being homicidally intimate with the widow of one of his victims. He admitted to the murders in great detail, providing just what police needed for an arrest. He explained that he found murder more sexually satisfying than sex. His ex-wife was given a new life in the witness protection program. Carmen, who was no longer married to the dentist, and her brother Nick were brought in for questioning to corroborate the allegations against Dr. Engelman. As possible co-conspirators, they asked for and were granted immunity to testify against the dentist. Carmen told quite the story. She said she was working for the dentist when he suggested she find someone with good benefits to marry. He told her about Eric Fry, whom he said he directed Sandy Fry to marry with all intentions of murdering the insurance proceeds. Soon after she was married, Carmen said Dr. Engelman told her where to go and made sure her husband was shot and killed. He staged it to look like a target shooting accident. Glennon Engelman was finally arrested and charged with murder in 1980. Carmen testified at Dr. Engelman's first trial, for which he was convicted of murdering Peter Hom and given 50 years in prison. The dentist then pled guilty to the murder of Sophie Barrera to avoid the death penalty. Serving a lift sentence for that murder in Missouri, Dr. Engelman was back in court by 1985 in Illinois. In 1984, Robert Handy, a convict and acquaintance of Dr. Engelman, admitted to authorities that he had taken part in the murder conspiracy of the Guswell family. 
he implicated Dr. Engelman, who had bludgeoned Ronald Goosewell and shot him, as well as Ronald's widow, Barbara Boyle. Dr. Engelman was given three life sentences for the Goosewell murders. He also was convicted of federal mail fraud and given a 30-year federal sentence. He is believed to have killed at least 12 people, including conspiring with his first wife to kill her husband, James Bullock, in 1958. Edna Ruth was never charged in the case due to lack of evidence. Barbara Boyle went on trial for the murder of her in-laws, Arthur and Vernita Goosewell, and husband Ronald in 1985. The jury acquitted her of the murders of Arthur and Vernita but convicted her of conspiracy to commit murder in the death of Ronald Goosewell. Barbara Boyle was sentenced to 50 years in prison in 1985. She was granted parole in 2009. Dr. Engelman enjoyed his notoriety in Missouri, often comparing himself to legendary outlaw Jesse James. He is believed to have killed at least 12 people, but the actual number is unknown. Unlike other serial killers, Dr. Engelman was inspired, at least in part, by greed. He also seemed to revel in his ability to not feel remorse. Dr. Engelman died of diabetes-related health issues in 1999 at age 72. He was incarcerated in Jefferson City at the time. Joseph Robert Miller was born on January 15, 1955, as Joseph Robert Tarkson. He was abandoned shortly after his birth at an orphanage. Luckily, Joseph was adopted. He was adopted by a Chicago couple who changed his last name to match theirs, Miller. His adoptive parents were strict disciplinarians. It is reported that he was often beaten and subjected to other forms of corporal punishment. As a result of this upbringing, Joseph had anger issues from a very early age. In addition to having anger issues, Joseph began demonstrating a criminal mentality from a very young age. He began committing petty crimes, such as theft, as a young boy. His criminal tendencies followed him into adulthood. By the time he was 23 years old, Joseph had been arrested 11 times. His crimes included theft, carjacking, and sexual assault. Somehow, he was able to negotiate plea deals following his arrests and only served short stints in prison. Joseph moved around a little during his early adulthood, living in Bloomington, Waukegan, and the state of Virginia. When he was 23, he settled in Skokie, Illinois, and married his wife, Marcia. He started working as a pizza delivery man. It seemed, perhaps, that Joseph Miller was starting to build a life as a productive member of society. But everything was not what it seemed. On October 25, 1977, a 31-year-old known prostitute named Martha Ryan, also known as Martha Kowalski, was reported missing from Chicago. Martha was last seen in the company of a young man who drove an orange Chevrolet Vega. Martha's friends said she had a date that evening. She had been wearing blue jeans, brown high heels, and a red jacket lined with a fur collar. Eight days after she was reported missing, her body was found wrapped in a blanket in the bushes behind a liquor store in Skokie. Joseph Miller was known to the police department and was suspected as he drove an orange Vega. For starters, he lived just down the road from where the body was found. He was currently in the county jail serving a 60-day sentence for contributing to the delinquency of a minor. While still investigating Martha's death, another body was found the following day. The second body was that of 22-year-old known prostitute and man -am. Both women had been strangled and were known prostitutes. The investigators hit the streets to question other prostitutes. One woman claimed that Joseph Miller and his wife Marcia frequently hired prostitutes, including herself. She claimed that she knew one of the victims and that she was a frequent customer of Miller's. Joseph Miller was arrested and charged with two counts of murder on November 5, 1977. While in police custody, police obtained a search warrant for Miller's car and apartment. Inside, police found evidence linking Miller to an armed robbery in Skokie, a kidnapping in Cook County, and an aggravated batter in DuPage County. With this evidence, Miller became the prime suspect in several other unsolved murders in the area dating back to 1976. Prosecutors told the media they planned to seek the death penalty. Joseph Miller did not deny his involvement. He confessed to the two murders. He said he had strangled the women when they asked for payment following sex. He wrapped them in bed sheets and towels, later dumping their bodies in isolated areas. 
he said his wife Marcia had assisted with disposing of the bodies, and she was charged with felonious concealment of a homicide. It is unknown what sentence, if any, she received for her involvement. During court proceedings, the judge ruled that the evidence found inside Miller's home and apartment was inadmissible due to procedural errors on the part of the police during the arrest process. Prosecutors wanted to compel Marcia Miller to testify against her husband, but she refused. Fearing they lacked evidence to convict, Cook County prosecutors offered a plea deal to Joseph Miller. Joseph Miller was convicted of two counts of murder, aggravated battery, kidnapping, and armed robbery. He was given a 30-year sentence, with a chance of parole after 15 years. Joseph Miller began serving his sentence at the Illinois River Correctional Center in Canton, Illinois. He participated in sex offender rehabilitation programs and was known to be a model prisoner. In the mid-1980s, Joseph suffered a severe injury to his leg. This caused permanent disability, and the confessed murderer began to draw a disability pension from the state of Illinois. After serving the minimum of his sentence, 15 years, Miller applied for parole. The parole board considered his record as a model prisoner as well as his disability. It was determined that Mr. Miller was no longer a threat to society, and he was released on parole in April 1993. Upon his release, Miller decided to move to Peoria at the suggestion of a prison chaplain. Once in Peoria, Joseph resided in a senior living community with several elderly residents, despite only being in his late thirties. He was known to be very friendly and active in activities. He attended church and went to nursing homes with other residents to pray for the nursing home patients. He was well-liked in the community, but many did not know of his dark past. Joseph began seeking work as a day laborer to supplement his disability income from the state of Illinois. He would perform odd jobs around elderly people's homes. In August of 1993, 88-year-old Bernice Fagot hired Joseph to do some home repairs. A few weeks later, the newspaper deliverer notified police that several newspapers were piling up at Bernice's home. Police did a wellness check, but Bernice was not in her home. She was reported as a missing person. Police interviewed her neighbors, family, and friends. Police worked feverishly to find the elderly woman. Around the same time, the bodies of three women were discovered in a ditch outside of Peoria. The women had all been murdered and were in various states of decomposition. They were eventually identified as 34-year-old Marcia Logue, 26-year-old Helen Dorrance, and 42-year-old Sandra Sesnici. Marcia had been bound and gagged. Her cause of death was determined to be a result of blunt force trauma and multiple stab wounds. The other two victims had been strangled. All three were known prostitutes in the Peoria area. According to witnesses, Marcia Logue was last seen on September 15, 1993. She was getting into a dark maroon van driven by a white man described as approximately 45 years old. Sandra disappeared the same day. Helen disappeared just a few days prior. A staff member at the Correctional Center in Canton, Illinois, heard about the murders and notified Joseph Miller's parole officer of the crimes and similarities to his known murders in Cook County. On September 23, 1993, Bernice Fagot's vehicle was found in a parking lot near the senior living community that Miller resided in. Joseph was brought in for questioning a few days later. He permitted officers to search his apartment and vehicle. He denied being involved in the crimes. Police didn't need Miller's confession this time. Inside Bernice's car, police located a knife with Miller's fingerprints on it. When confronted with this evidence, Miller admitted it was his. He said he had dropped it while driving and was not sure how it ended up in Fagat's car. With this evidence, police secured a warrant for his arrest under the charge of burglary. Meanwhile, Bernice was still missing. Continuing their investigation, police found numerous pieces of evidence linking Miller to the three murders. Police seized women's clothing, blood-stained sheets, a mattress covered with dried blood on it, and blood stains on the bedroom wall. Several strands of human hair and other fibers were also collected. Forensic examiners used this evidence to collect DNA evidence, which positively linked Joseph Miller to the murders of all three women. In Bernice's vehicle, Police also found a rug and knife in the trunk of the car and dried blood stains on the back seat. A witness and neighbor of Bernice Fagat identified Joseph Miller as a repairman hired by the elderly woman to do house repairs around August 28, when she was last seen. 
a security guard at the senior living community where Miller lived told detectives that he saw Joseph Miller driving a maroon Oldsmobile on multiple occasions. At the time, the guard had no idea it belonged to a missing person or that it had been identified as the vehicle picking up one of the murdered women. A friend of Miller's also came forward, stating he had been in the vehicle with Miller and found Fagot's social security card in the glove box. According to this witness, Miller admitted to stealing the vehicle and said he wanted to sell it to get rid of it. Peoria prosecutors vowed to seek the death penalty against Joseph Miller, but skeptical newspaper reporters pointed out that Cook County had also made this statement in 1977. The defense quickly filed for a change of venue, citing publicity. The motion was granted, and the trial was moved to Springfield, Illinois. With a plethora of evidence against him, Miller initially entered a guilty plea. He later changed the plea to not guilty because of insanity. Miller's defense claimed that he suffered from multiple personality disorder and dissociative amnesia resulting from childhood abuse. The jury didn't take long to convict Joseph Miller of six counts of first-degree murder, two for each victim. In court, Miller smugly said, It's kind of hard to do the same thing twice, Chicago Tribune, 1994. He was not charged for Bernice Fagot's murder as her body was never found. While she is presumed to be another murder victim of Joseph Miller, the whereabouts of her remains are still a mystery. During the sentencing phase, the state presented the aggravating factors including the sexual assaults of the victims, Miller's history of two murder convictions, and the fact that he was paroled in April of 1993 and killed just a few months later in September of 1993. The defense presented evidence that Miller was abused and suffered from mental illnesses as a result. Nevertheless, the jury agreed that the mitigating factors did not outweigh the aggravating factors and sentenced Joseph Miller to death. Joseph Miller was transferred to Menard Correctional Center in Chester, Illinois, to await his punishment on death row. In the early 2000s, former Illinois Governor George Ryan commuted all death sentences to life in prison, including that of Joseph Miller. Illinois later abolished the death penalty. Joseph Miller was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. In 2004, Miller contacted Cook County prosecutors and claimed responsibility for the murders of 18-year-old Valerie Sloan and 25-year-old Stacy Morrison. Both women had disappeared from the Peoria area in 1993. He told the authorities where he buried the bodies, but no remains were ever found. Authorities believe this was a false confession, but he has not been ruled out in those disappearances which remain unsolved. Joseph Miller, listed in the Illinois Department of Corrections as Joseph P. Miller, is currently incarcerated at the Dixon Correctional Center in Dixon, Illinois. He is currently 68 years old. He has no chance of freedom ever again, but the second chance he was given in 1993 resulted in the murders of at least four more women. The system has failed. John Joseph Schubert IV was born July 2, 1963, in Lawrence, Massachusetts to Joseph and Beverly Joubert. He became a big brother two years later to his sister, Jane. Jane would eventually become a police officer, while John would become a monster. As a young child, John witnessed his father strangle his mother. She survived and filed for divorce. She moved her children to Maine and cut ties with John's father. John was a highly intelligent child who started to read at age three and was reading multiple library books fluently by age five. His estimated IQ was 123. John joined Boy Scouts of America and remained active throughout his childhood. He went far in the Scouts, achieving the honor of Eagle Scout. He was a cute little boy with dark hair and eyes and the charisma to match. However, underneath was hidden evil inside young John. John displayed behavior indicative of sociopathy at a very early age. At age six, John fantasized about stabbing his babysitter to death. He would later state he fantasized about torturing her and eating her body. By age eight, he was fantasizing about mass murder. He also thought about kidnapping, raping, and torturing strangers until they begged for help. Before long, he began to act on some of his disturbing fantasies. John was known to other children as a vicious bully. When adults were around, however, John displayed so much charisma he was able to manipulate his way out of trouble. When he was thirteen years old, he stabbed a nine-year-old girl with a pencil. The girl screamed out in pain, at which point John became sexually aroused. The next day, he slashed another girl with a razor blade. 
again, he became sexually aroused. As a teenager, John attacked two young boys. He brutally beat them, choked them, and stole their belongings. One boy nearly died, but John somehow got away with it. Violence excited him, and he knew how to get away with it. On August 22, 1982, 11-year-old Richard Ricky Stetson went for a jog near his home in Portland, Maine. Ricky was a small kid with red hair and freckles. Ricky was born on March 5, 1971. Witnesses said they saw him jogging on a popular bike trail, but Ricky never made it home. His mother reported him missing around 7 o'clock that evening. The following day, a motorist spotted something on the side of Highway I-295. It was the bloody body of Ricky Stetson. It was initially thought the young man was hit by a vehicle and killed. Upon autopsy, however, it was determined that Ricky met a much more brutal fate. The autopsy determined that Ricky had been choked, beaten, strangled with a ligature, and then stabbed several times in his abdomen. Acute blood loss was the cause of death. Ricky had bite marks on his body, indicating he suffered a tragic and painful death. A few years before Stetson's murder, boys in the area were being attacked and stabbed with a knife. However, none of them suffered fatal injuries. The unknown assailant was known as the Oakdale Slasher. He was described as being a young man in his early twenties or late teens with dark hair. Witnesses described a young man with a similar description following Ricky Stetson before he was murdered. Did the Oakdale Slasher strike again with escalated violence? Police in Maine searched high and low for a suspect, finally identifying one. However, this person's bite mark pattern was not a match to the marks on Ricky's body. With no other suspects or leads, the case went cold. Meanwhile, John Joubert graduated high school and enlisted in the United States Air Force. He was stationed in Bellevue, Nebraska. On September 18, 1983, Danny Joe Eberly left his house at 6 a.m. to deliver newspapers in his Nebraska community. He delivered his first three papers, but the other residents did not receive their papers by mid-morning. Complaints were called into the newspaper, prompting a search of the newspaper route. Police found more than 60 newspapers and Danny's bike quickly along his route. Danny was nowhere to be found. Danny Joe Eberly was born on January 12, 1970. He was a smart young man with blonde hair and blue eyes. Danny and his brother took the job delivering papers to save money for accessories for their bicycles. They usually rode together, but on this day Danny was alone. When they found his bicycle, Danny was reported as a missing person. The FBI was notified as this was considered a child abduction. A large-scale search ensued to find Danny, with hopes that the boy was still alive. Three days after he disappeared, authorities found the deceased body of Danny Joe Eberly. He had been bound, gagged, and was only partially dressed when they found his remains. The autopsy revealed he was beaten, bitten, choked, undressed, and finally stabbed to death. The boy endured nine fatal stab wounds that punctured his lungs, liver, and heart. The killer had also carved a star shape into the boy's bare chest. The rope used to bind him was unique, one the FBI profiler had never seen before. Consisting of 26 types of fibers and 106 colors, the rope would be the key to solving this crime. The tragic death of Danny Joe Eberly shocked and disturbed the entire community. Children were not allowed out alone, playgrounds were abandoned, and many paper boys left their jobs. To say the heinous murder changed the small town would be an understatement. It terrified residents to their cores. Two months later, however, the serial killer struck again in Papillion, Nebraska. On December 2, 1983, 12-year-old Christopher Walden walked to school. An elderly woman witnessed a tan vehicle pull up next to Christopher and kidnap them with a knife to his throat. She described the man as young with dark hair. She was so shaken up that she didn't even know if what had happened was real. She didn't report what he witnessed until she heard that Christopher was missing. Christopher Walden was born September 28, 1971, in Omaha, Nebraska. He was the son of Lt. Col. USAF Stephen Walden. His father was stationed at Offutt Air Force Base in Nebraska, the same base as John Joubert. Christopher had blonde hair, blue eyes, and an infectious smile. His disappearance disturbed the community, which was already reeling from the loss of Danny Eberly. 
Christopher's parents feared he was dead from the moment he disappeared. Another large-scale search ensued, but unfortunately ended the same way as the search for Danny. Three days later, two hunters found Christopher's body in the snow-covered wilderness. His body was found less than three miles from where Danny was discovered months earlier. The cases were linked, a suspicion confirmed by the autopsy results. Christopher's autopsy revealed he was murdered after being viciously tortured. The same shape was carved into both boys' chests. Christopher was found nearly nude, only in underwear, and had been stabbed repeatedly. His throat was slit so deeply that he was nearly decapitated. The medical examiner found evidence that Christopher was likely still alive when most of the torture on his body was inflicted. He died a terrible death at the hands of a serial predator. The local sheriff Patrick Thomas said at a press conference following the murder, I think that the person who's responsible for these acts is very sick, spineless, a coward. I would urge him to call a minister, priest, or me. The local community was on guard. The local Boy Scout troop was even affected, with the scoutmaster focused on preventing another boy from becoming a victim. After the teaching, the volunteer assistant scoutmaster said, as long as we look out for one another, we'll have nothing to worry about. That assistant scoutmaster was John Joubert. The killer made a mistake though, and someone saw him. The elderly woman who witnessed Christopher's kidnapping was able to describe him. FBI profiler Robert Ressler was called in to develop a profile of the killer. The profiler said the killer likely had a job nearby, was likely involved in coaching youth or Boy Scouts, had knowledge of forensics, and read detective magazines. He further believed the killer watched the news coverage of the crimes and would be eager to talk about his crimes. On January 11, 1984, Barbara Weaver arrived at her workplace at a local daycare center. As she prepared for her day, Barbara noticed a car driving around the daycare center suspiciously. She went outside to start writing down the license plate number. The man in the car approached her, asking for directions. He quickly furnished a knife and lunged at Barbara. Barbara took off running as the man screamed, Get back here or I'll kill you. Barbara managed to escape with the perpetrator's license plate number. Police were able to easily track the license plates to a local airman named John Joubert. Less than two hours after he attacked Barbara, military police arrested John Joubert in his barracks. Once they started questioning him, police realized that John fit the FBI's profile of the killer now known as the Woodford Slasher. He matched the profile so well that he became an immediate suspect. John was 20 years old, an assistant scoutmaster with Boy Scouts, read detective and pornography magazines, and fit the physical description provided by the witness in Christopher's abduction. A search warrant was executed on John Joubert's vehicle which recovered multiple hairs and a piece of rope that matched the unique rope used to bind Danny Eberly exactly. The FBI was able to determine the rope was made in Korea for the United States military. In his barracks, they found a knife and more of the rope. This gave detectives enough evidence to feel confident that John Joubert was the Woodford slasher. Under interrogation, John admitted to trying to rob Barbara. When the detectives asked him if he was aware of the murders of Danny and Christopher, he smiled. He admitted that he had read about them. When shown pictures of the crime scenes, he denied being responsible for the heinous crimes but was visibly aroused by the photos. John was confronted about the rope, which he claimed was given to him by the scoutmaster of the Boy Scout troop. Under more pressure, John Joubert finally confessed to the murders. I did it. I killed those boys, he said. He went on to give a full videotaped confession. He chose to talk about Christopher Walden first, admitting he forced the boy into the woods by knife point. He ordered Christopher to strip down to his underwear and ordered him to the ground. When Christopher refused and tried to run, John chased him down and slit his throat. He then started a bloody stabbing frenzy. When describing Danny Joe Eberly's murder, John said he forced him at knife point into a remote area. He then forced the boy to strip to his underwear. He recalled Danny begging for his life as John stabbed him repeatedly. Despite the boy's pleas, John continued to stab him until the boy was dead. Then, he said, he went to McDonald's and ordered breakfast. John remained cold throughout his confession and provided no motive to police other than satisfying his fantasies. While waiting trial for the murders in Nebraska, Maine authorities asked to question Jaber related to the death of Ricky Stetson. 
Under questioning, John admitted to being the Oakdale slasher, who attacked multiple boys in Maine. He didn't confess to the murder of Ricky Stetson, however. Police were confident that the Oakdale slasher and Woodford slasher were the same man. On July 3, 1984, the day after he turned 21, John Jaber pleaded guilty to the murders of Danny Joe Eberly and Christopher Walden. He initially planned to plead not guilty, but psychologists determined he was fit to stand trial and was not insane at the time of the murders. Facing the possibility of the death penalty, John Jaber opted to plead guilty with hopes that Nebraska would spare his life. However, in October of 1984, the judge sentenced John Jaber to death for his crimes. In 1989, John was extradited to Maine to stand trial for the murder of Richard Ricky Stetson. Evidence connected John to the murder, specifically the bite mark patterns left on the young boy's body. In October of 1990, Joubert was found guilty in Maine and sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. He was then sent back to Nebraska to face the death penalty. During his time on death row, Joubert appealed his conviction and sentence multiple times to no avail. He was scheduled to die July 17, 1996. John pleaded to the courts to save his life despite admitting that if freed, he would kill again. As the execution date neared, he requested copies of the crime scene photos for masturbation purposes. This request was, of course, denied. His final meal consisted of pizza with green peppers and onions, strawberry cheesecake, and a bottle of Coca-Cola. Just after midnight on July 17th, 1996, John's head was shaved, and he was escorted down the hall to the death chamber. In 1996, Nebraska was still using the electric chair to carry out executions. In his final statement, John Jaber said, I just want to say that, again, I am sorry for what I've done. I don't know if my death will change anything or bring anyone peace, and I just ask the families of Danny Eberly, Christopher Walden, and Richard Stetson to please try to find some peace and the people of Nebraska forgive me. That's all. At 12.14 a.m., 2,450 volts of electricity surged through John's body. Two more shocks followed before the electric chair was deactivated. John was slumped over dead with smoke seeping from his mask and his fists clenched. At 12.22 a.m., 33-year-old John Jaber was pronounced dead. John had a four-inch brain blister on the top of his head with blisters above both ears as well. This finding prompted death penalty activists to make a case that the electric chair was cruel and unusual punishment. Nebraska now uses lethal injection to carry out capital punishment. Ricky, Danny, and Christopher die heinous deaths at the hands of a very young man who demonstrated sadistic and sociopathic tendencies from a very young age. John Jaber was a true monster in every sense of the word. Had he been allowed to continue to live freely, the death toll would have been significantly higher. The state of Nebraska made sure that no other person would suffer at the hands of this evil, despicable animal known as the Woodford Slasher.